to violate the prohibition on cell phones just because Grasa has so many fantastic accolades and awards and I want to uh, attribute <laughs> all the great grandeur that she deserves. But first I want to thank her and Tony, my other team co-lead, and Chris Gorski, who's been so uh, amazing over the last f six months, seven months, maybe even a year when we first yeah. had the inkling to do this. This is really Grasa's brainchild and she deserves so much of the credit and none of the blame if anything should go wrong. I'm sure something will go wrong, but it's our fault if it does. I want to thank Michelle and Janet as well. So I'll keep this very brief. I just wanted to mention her many honors and awards because those are very important to recognize in this field. We have such a vibrant uh, set of folks that work in this field, and Grasa is one of the most vibrant. I've gotten to know her very well over the last uh, couple of years. She's been to San Diego many times, and I've gotten to see her up here. I just want to mention two uh, main awards that she's received recently. One is the Exceptional Achievement Medal which is quite uh, fantastic from NASA, and that came in 2014. And the other award, which really uh, is, is, is sort of intriguing, is the Mariner Award, because I don't know her to be particularly adept on the ocean, but in other words, <laughs> she received this for leading a team to calculate the cosmological parameters from the CMB with different foreground removal method, methods, demonstrating robustness of estimates. And Gross is nothing if not robust. I've <laughs> had the honor to work with her, and she has so many great ideas, and. She's really a driving force behind this uh, workshop. So thank you, Grasa. It's my pleasure to introduce Grasa Rasha. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Brian. No, I don't. I think I So good morning and welcome. So um, this morning, I'm going to give an introduction to the short course that you'll be attending today. Uh, but before I do that, I would like to say thank you to the to the KISS, to the, the Keck Institute for Space uh, Studies to sponsor this event and in particular to sponsor the, the KISS workshop that will take place during this week on designing future CMB experiments. So thank you so much, uh, uh, Tom Prince, uh, Michelle Judd, uh, Jeanette Siad, uh, and uh, Irina, uh, Irina that helped us with the wiki page and web page and things like that. Okay, so let's start. Um, the title of my talk is Painting a Picture of the Cosmos. What I want to, uh, to really to give you the idea is how far we have come since the early times when we were thinking what the universe is about, what cosmos is about. So in initial time, of course, we came from early speculations without quantitative observational support at all. And I'll give you some examples of how the universe where you visit, in particular the light one, which is a, the hierarchy to fractal universe of Kant and Lambert. It's an interesting concept, in fact. So there are several examples here given, but as I said, these were early times and were mostly speculations without any observational support. Oh, of course, yes, yes, <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, so from those early times of speculation to the era of precision cosmology, and in particular here with observations of the cosmic micro background radiation, this remnant radiation that comes from the early times, from the time where the universe was in its infancy, and with it, this cosmic micro background radiation brings a lot of information how uh, the universe looked like at those early times, uh, gives information about, for example, what the universe will look like today, and potentially how it will uh, eventually uh, die. So here I'm showing, uh, I have to say that we have been very uh, privileged to have uh, witnessed uh, the presence of three uh, very uh, successful satellite missions and uh, uh, remarkable suborbital experiments uh, looking and doing uh, CMB exploration on the sky. Here in this particular image, I'm showing um, maps rendered, maps of the cosmic microbrain radiation rendered from COBE, WMAP, and Planck satellites. When you go from left to right, what you see is the increasing of resolution of these maps, and in fact, as well, an increasing resolution sensitivity. And these, with this particular, um, um, incremental uh, de technological developments, uh, instrument and data analysis that we managed to get to the area precision and constrain cosmological parameters with uh, in, uh, unprecedented accuracy, in particular with Planck. And these cosmological parameters are the ones that tell us and, and describes the universe and the cosmos uh, we, we see today. Um, Okay, so from these maps, you see that you have cold and hot spots. You have orange and uh, blue and orange spots. And it's basically from these spots, which are the basic temperature fluctuations uh, of this uh, radiation, which correspond to fluctuations in density and are actually the seeds of structure that we see today. And that's from these particular uh, variations that we can actually infer a plethora of information about the university today. Now, 
Let me start, and everyone, most people know this cartoon, but this cartoon, in my view, illustrates very nicely our current picture of the universe, as opposed to these early pictures of the universe I've showed in the first slide. Um, and the story goes as, uh, like this. At the start, we have the Big Bang. We have a big uh, <coughs> explosion, which is followed by a cosmic inflation, by a fast expansion of the universe called inflation, cosmic inflation. Um, we'll be hearing today Joe Silk talking about predictions but from these inflationary scenarios and Paul Steinhardt commenting on those predictions and talking about alternative models. Later on in time, we see that um, the, during this period, in particular this inflation period, is when w the fluctuations emerge and are originated. Later on, uh, as the universe expands and cools down, particles form and at some stage right around one, well, uh, 100 years or, well, earlier than that, we have that ordinary matter particles are coupled to light and coupled to, uh, to dark matter and uh, start building structures in this period of time. 380,000 years later, the universe cooled down sufficiently for at neutral atoms of hydrogen to form, and at this point, ordinary matter and photons decouple, and the symbiote radiation in this stage uh, is released and freely streamed towards us. And here, this period is called recombination, and uh, this uh, surface here of hot and cold spots is called last scattering surface. So um, during, after that particular period of time, we see that then ordinary matter, in, as I said, and particles decouple from the CMB photons, and it's followed by a period of dark ages, where the ordinary matter particles follow into the structure, the gravitational wells that were created by dark matter. It is not until 200 uh, million years after the Big Bang that first stars and galaxies form. When stars form, they emit radiation and they manage to reunite, reunite the universe. And this is called the period of reionization. The reionization is also a period that can be constrained with CMB. It leaves an imprint on CMB photons and we can constrain it, in particular from the polarization of the CMB, it's clearly seen. I should mention that we are, I mentioned just temperature fluctuations, but of course, because we have a process of Thomson scattering of, a, of an inisotropic radiation field, we expect these photons to be polarized. And from the polarization, we also, of course, get a wealth of information about the universe. Very important. Um, so uh, as time goes on from this point onwards, of course, with galaxies uh, evolve, um, clusters and uh, superclusters uh, of galaxies form. And this is basically a picture of large-scale structures we see, very filamentary, from galaxy surveys, uh, large-scale structure galaxy surveys. Now, as you can see, the photons from the CMB in this journey towards us have to go through all these uh, clumps of matter. And as you know from one of the pivotal, one of the key predictions from general relativity is that matter um, uh, deflects light and therefore CMB photons are deflected by these clumps of matter. Basically what I'm saying is that they are gravitational lens by matter. And you can see that with the CMB, you can see this, uh, this effect in the CMB. And we'll have today uh, um, uh, Anthony Shalin or later on talking about the exact lensing of CMB by uh, by the matter, by inter uh, intervening matter between us and the last getting surface, and uh, the importance for, in particular, for future CMB exploration, uh, the uh, polarization of the CMB. But now let's go, and by the way, I should say that this lensing was, of course, observed, and in particular with Planck with uh, the highly statistical significance to date. Now let's zoom in in a particular region here today, and uh, this region today turns out to be a cluster of galaxies. I should also mention that in case of Planck, we also detected, in fact, discovered the clusters uh, through the sunay zeldovich effect. Let's now zoom into one of these regions, uh, small regions here, and what you see is our own galaxy, spiral galaxy. And we, ourselves, are located in one of these spiral arms of this, uh, this, galactic, this galaxy. Um, and of course, if you zoom in into this small region sky, we have our own solar system and our planet Earth. Now, what's interesting here, though, is as you can see now, the CMB photons will have to go through our own galaxy. So when any CMB observation, in particular Planck, observes the sky, it doesn't observe a pristine CMB. What it observes is CMB plus foreground emission from our own galaxy, free-free, uh, uh, synchrotron, dust emission, etc. And you also see emission from other extragalactic objects. And we have to uh, somehow get to the pristine CMB from this plethora of uh, emission in our maps. And later on today, we'll have Jacques Delarue talking about exactly the role of foregrounds and uh, their importance uh, uh, for, for, for the future of CMB exploration, and in particular ways of separating these foregrounds from the CMB. 
Well, now we are here. We are on Earth, and in particular, let's say, CMB experiments are located in ground beds, balloon experiments, but Planck in particular was in the Lagrangian point L2 from the Sun Earth system. And what's important here now is that when you observe the sky, you have to devise some scan strategies or observing, observing strategies, strategies to avoid the sun, to avoid the moon. Also, we'll be plugged with zodiacal light, basically the uh, sunlight scattered by the interplanetary dust particles on the zodiacal cloud. And we have to clean from several other effects, in particular from systematics from the own instrument. So usually the idea is that scientists design an instrument to minimize the, the, the minimize systematics, to increase sensitivity, to increase resolution, whatever is the goal they want with their own instrument. However, of course, there are always residual systematics. There are always imponderables. There are always um, uh, surprises. And we know very well, anyone in this room that went in Planck, that it's, it's really hard. Uh, and one of the things we learned from Splunk is that Planck is really hard to deal and, uh, with the systematics, in particular polarization data. It's very important, can be done, but it's very hard to do. And today we'll have Alan Corgut talking about um, uh, addressing the technological challenges posed by an ultimate mission of CMB uh, polarization. So this is our picture of the cosmos today. Now, just quickly, from the CMB, as I said earlier, just from these cold and hot spots, you can learn a great deal about the, the universe. What we do is we compress the data into angular power spectrum, which is basically giving us an idea of the amplitude of these fluctuations as a function of the angular scale. Then we compare this angular power spectrum to some models, models of large-scale structure formation, and we find a fit. And the fit on the best fit model is given by this green curve. It goes perfectly well through all the <laughs> data points you see here. What's interesting here is that previous CMB experiments, and more lately uh, Planck, um, oh, basically um, concluded that the standard model, a cosmological constant called dark matter model, is the model that describes well the data, describes well our universe today. And this is a model where you have a flat universe. Uh, dominated late times by uh, dark matter, by a mysterious dark energy which causes the accelerated expansion uh, that we observe. Uh, and on the top of that background, we have fluctuations, we have density fluctuations um, that emerge plausibly during the period of inflation, the early times, and are evolving and growing, uh, and are basically uh, Gaussian fluctuations, uh, approximately scale invariant, nearly scale invariant, adiabatic fluctuations. So this is our picture at the moment of the universe and these fluctuations. Of course, as I said, temperature is also polarized. We can do the same thing with polarization, and in particular here for the mode of polarization, E mode of polarization, which is one particular that comes from scalar fluctuations, from the density fluctuations. This has been detected, and we are uh, in Planck in particular, halfway through complete our analysis to look at consistencies between the temperature and polarization data in terms of constraining cosmological parameters. However, there is another mode in the polarization CMB which has not yet been observed, and these are the B modes. And they are of great, great importance, as I'll tell you in a minute. I'm almost finishing. So, first of all, I should say that our picture of the cosmos is not complete yet, of course. Um, inflation models predict a significant stochastic background gravitational waves that should have left a faint polarization signal in CMB, very faint, and that's the point, is a very faint, tiny signal in CMB polarized data. We know that currently there is a joint analysis, of, well, from the joint analysis of Planck, uh, Bicep, and Keck, only places limits on this amplitude of these signals. So if we, uh, oh, well, uh, any detection of this gravity wave, the so-called B modes, would reveal a fundamental physics at energy scales inaccessible to any terrestrial laboratory. And this is why we are here today. We are looking at why and how the future is going to be exploration. Why should we go, in particular, searching for these remotes, on the quest of remotes, searching, searching for gravitational waves? Because at the end, they are really the smoking gun of inflation. So without further ado, let us start. <laughs> 